the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23. Matthew, chapter 23, I'm going to read just one verse. Matthew 23, and verse 33, the Bible says, You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation Dear Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy that's brought us this way one more time, this side of eternity. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to look into your word. Lord, we may, may that we always recognize and know that it's, it's not commonplace, but rather a privilege uh, even to hold a copy of your word in our hands. Lord, we thank you uh, for your many blessings. Lord, we pray this morning that you'd set uh, sin and the world aside, that we might focus in on your word, that there'd be no malice, that there would be uh, nothing that might hinder, but rather we would look in the word to see you. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, fairly familiar verses of scripture, our Lord Jesus Christ uh, we want to, and, and he was, he was addressing the Sanhedrin or, and, and, the, and the Jews, the uh, elite of the day. Uh, but we always want to apply this scripture to someone else. It's the Pharisees, it's the Sadducees, it's the Sanhedrin. Well, he was addressing it to us. He, he was giving the very same message to you and I and everyone that sits in the building, everyone that's hearing me under the sound of their voice, this is you, ye serpents. Now, he was saying a mouthful when he said that because really it was a reference of the attack of Satan on mankind way back in the Garden of Eden, ye serpents. You, you are just like the devil. You are just like the nature of Antichrist. You are just like the nature of sin that consumes us, ye serpents. Now, when you think about that, also think about they were very religious people. They understood and knew the law better than we would ever know if we even started studying it today. Ye serpents. Uh, you know what? Uh, a serpent, really, if you think about it, has very little use. Uh, I'm sure he takes care. There's some breed, I understand, that takes care of, uh, of uh, moles and stuff. And uh, my papa used to keep them in the corn crib to take care of mice and stuff. I'm sure they have a purpose. But you know, if you ever see a, a, a serpent, it's a scary thing. And it doesn't have to be uh, a poisonous one. These people that say, oh, you know, if, if it's not poisonous, I'm not worried about it. Well, I'll say this, it's still a serpent. It is still, uh, it is still got that picture about it. It carries the, uh, it carries the appearance of sin. You serpents, you serpents, you generation of vipers. Now we live in a day that this generation has arrived. A generation of vipers. If you don't believe that, go to a school somewhere and and look around. You generation of vipers. Uh, when I teach, I find more and more people have no respect. We, we've raised a generation that does not respect anything or anyone. They do not respect the aged. They do not respect the Word of God. They do not... They, in fact, they pride themselves with lack of respect. It's been called by many Generation X. You know, that means they weren't understanding an X and an algebra problem. They weren't sure what that generation would be. Well, I feel the X this morning, and the X is filled as a Bible. That, that's their nature. And, and not only their nature, our nature too, but I believe it's been accentuated very much in the generation that which uh, now are becoming young, and, young adult because they really have no care for anything and nothing, nothing guides their path. You know what? We really are in the same condition and until the Lord saves our soul, even the Word of God doesn't guide our paths. What, what makes the difference when He uh, saves our soul, we become interested in this, and it comes for, becomes a guide and a map for us. But in this days, it was not that. They knew it, they knew about it, but they did not know it. You serpents, you generations of, you generation of vipers, plural, how can ye escape the damnation? 
damnation of hell. Now, I, I'm asking that this morning. I'm putting forth this question for you because he says, How shall ye escape the damnation of hell? Now, there is every answer that you could think of that you might come up with that. Baptism, agreeing that there is a God, none of those will work. The way that you escape the damnation of hell is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That is how ye escape the damnation of hell. When he makes your awfulness, the awfulness of your sin a reality, and you cry out to him. You know what? Armenian doctrine will teach you this. Look back in time, uh, look back in your life and see if there's a time and a place you accepted him. No, no, you look back and see if there was a time and a place where you beheld the awfulness of sin that lives in you. That is the difference. Because you will never, never cry out to a Savior until you know that you need him. Until you know that he he's something. Uh, that he's, that he's something that you absolutely have to have. You serpents, you vipers. Uh, you are... Uh, and again, I'll say about this, the viper, and we'll move on. Snakes are scary. Snakes are not a pleasant thing. Uh, spiders don't bother me. When we worked on Adam's first little house, there were spiders everywhere, and, and he would run, and he, he wanted to scream, but he wasn't because he was an adult. He's afraid of spiders. I'm not. I just, they don't bother me. But I hate snakes. And in the new house, there were snakes. Uh, four that we know of. Some guy that came to work on the cable took one home with him. That's, a, you know, why would you want a snake? But you know what? Separate and apart of the goodness of God, we choose spiritual snakes mm. over the goodness of God. Mm. Uh, you got to be careful because you know when a snake can hurt you most when you don't know that he's there. Yeah. I told you the story. Adam had his leg hanging down under the house and I was coming toward him under the house. And I said, Adam, there's a snake under your foot. And he said, no, it's not. And he looked down and he goes, oh, yes it is. And the foot disappeared. That, that's, a natural, that's a natural reaction to snakes. Now, today we live in a generation X where they're not fearful. The snake can be beside him. The snake can be wrapped around his leg. And there is no fear. There is no prowling about. And re the reason why they are the generation of vipers. They prefer that thing. They desire that thing more than anything else. And so we see that this was the situation. Go, uh, go back with me uh, to uh, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Chapter number 22. 2 Samuel chapter number 22. Uh, concerning David. 2 Samuel chapter 22 in the very first verse. And David spake unto the Lord the words of, his, of this song in the day that the Lord had, de had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. Now, I want you to see, it should be a normal thing, if you, you know, to, to sing a song of deliverance. You know what? One reason I don't think people get shaken up over hell and shaken up over their need of salvation, they don't see God's people rejoice in the blessing of it, so it's not attractive to them. In other words, we, well, maybe we can hang on till the Lord comes. You know what? I don't. I, I know I'll hang on until the Lord comes. Either if I'm pushing up daisies out there, or if I, I'm at, when He calls us out of here, I'm in the living. I know He'll sustain me because He is who He says He is. We we should be the most happy people on earth. We should be rejoicing in the Son of God. And David was. He'd been delivered completely. Verse two, and he said, "The Lord is my rock." and my fortress, and my deliverer. We need nothing else. Listen, we don't need baptism.
Calvinism. We don't need church membership in the sense of any kind of redemptive quality at all. We need an experience with Christ. Nothing more and nothing less. He called him a deliverer. Now let me say this, lost friend, to have a deliverer, you've got to know that the enemy is about it. To, have, to need a deliverer, you've got to know that you're looking face to face with an enemy. And uh, if you don't get nothing else this morning, get this. You're facing an enemy. And, and his name is Satan and Lucifer. That, that's who we're facing. Verse 3, David says, The God of my rock, in Him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my Savior. Thou, sayest, thou savest me from violence. Now, what a wonderful proclamation, but one of them I want you to particularly pay attention to is you're my shield. You know what? Uh, when, when the darts come your way, ye have a shield. You have a shield to protect you. That is the Son of God. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me say this. Satan will come your way. He will give you every temptation under the sun. He knows what you like. He knows what you're tempted by. And that's the arrows he'll use. That, that's the things that He'll present against you. He, he will give you things. Uh, he will present things that He knows will, will be very appealing. Verse 4, I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. When the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men make me afraid. The sorrows of hell come past me about. The snares of death prevented me. Now the first thing I want you to see about hell, this place where the, uh, where the serpents and the vipers go, is the sorrows plural. Now we live in a day and age where people don't even know what uh, sorrow is. Now number one, we've reduced it. You know, you can do something horrifically mean. Well, I'm sorry. You know what? That, that means less than nothing in the modern day. You're not sorry. We're not sorry. The generation that sits before us, they're not sorry of anything. They pride themselves in unbelief. They pride themselves seeking their own idea. They pride themselves reaching an, ex an, an explanation of things that can't be explained. They pride themselves in it. There, there's, no, no, there's nothing in that. And from that, from that, they reduce the sorrows of hell. Sorrow is plural. You know, the biggest sorrow of hell is this. You'll regret this life. That's a sorrow of hell. We'll see from the rich man, and you all know it, how intact his memory was. You'll be very sorry of sitting under the sound of preaching and largely ignoring it. You'll, you'll be sorry of the choices you made. You know what? Even the living, I, th there's some choices that I still regret today. That, that's a sorrow to me. But can you imagine leaving this place without Jesus? Le leaving this place without forgiveness? There'll be a great deal of sorrow. And you know what? The Bible is very clear that hell will be hotter for those that have heard. You know what? And this may seem cruel. Everybody says, well, what about the little African nations and people in the deep jungle that never have heard? They're going to hell. And if I didn't believe that, I would not be missionary. I'd be Baptist, but I'd be a primitive Baptist. But you know what? I believe they will go to hell, so I go. I, I continue to serve them. You know, you know why? Because the Bible says even the heavens declare that there is God. When, when they look up from wherever they're at and they look at the magnificent thing before them, it declares there is a God. And here we hear the gospel week after week after week, preaching the truth, teaching the truth, and we ignore it. That is a sorrow you'll live with forever. Another sorrow that you'll live with is being a fake. Judas Iscariot spent three and a half years with the Lord Jesus Christ. And 
he was nothing but a fake. You know what? I still believe today that he's living in the misery and the sorrows of being a fake. Remember, two things about Jesus. Remember what it said to him? It said that he repented himself. That, that's a very poor quality of, re, uh, of repentance. You know, when you repent accurately, you repent to God Almighty. Saying, you were right, and I was desperately wrong. That's repentance. He repented himself. That means you got caught, and you're upset because you got caught. It also says concerning uh, Judas, and he was sent to his place. His place specifically. That gives us another insight into hell this morning. It's particular. I believe in particular, particular redemption, don't you? Well, then, if you believe in particular redemption, you would almost have to believe in a particular hell, would you not? Now, we know the generalities of hell, and we know the generalities of, of heaven, but you know what? There are specifics to hell. And Judas went to his box. He went to his place. He went to his cell. He went to the place that was preserved for him. And he's locked up there. And he even is today. He went to his place. So lost friend, I'm telling you this morning. If, uh, if you're not saved, there's a specific place for you in hell. A specific, a specific place where these sorrows come about. How many times have you been truly sorry? The, the few times, and, and, and sad to say that if you were honest with me, you'd say the same, thing, the same thing too. The few times I've been truly sorry of my action that kept me up at night. The, the few times I've been sorry for my actions, I've, I've shed some tears. Now, I'm not talking unto Christ, but if you don't shed tears unto Christ, I'd make my calling in relation sure. I've said to some things to my mother that I regret even to this day. You know what? I, I, I've lost sleep and shed some tears over that. Think about how people that neglect Christ, as they said in hell, how they'll remember those things. How, how that will be a sorrow. You know what the Bible says of fakes? They become twofold more the child of hell. That means you're doubly responsible. So I would be careful. If I wasn't assured in, in, in the truth, if I wasn't assured of my salvation, then the sorrows would be around me. The sorrows would be near unto me. The sorrows would be a reality. Verse 7, and we'll move on. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and He did hear my voice out of His temple, and my cry did enter into His ears. I want you to notice two things. First of all, His distress, it grew from His sorrow, it grew from His helplessness, it grew from His need. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and He heard me. Listen, if your salvation don't line up with that, you better, you better look at yourself real good. If you never was distressed over sin, you better look at yourself real good. If you've never been uh, fearful of dying, you better look at yourself real good. Because David was in distresses. And I understand he was in a true battle, but I do know this, he was delivered from his enemy. And if you've never been in a spiritual battle, probably you've never been saved to start with. Go with me to the little book of Jonah. Very, very familiar verses of Scripture. Jonah, in the first verse. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, thy great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Now Jonah was a preacher, and he says, Go and cry against Nineveh. Now, everybody wants to get down on Jonah, 
But you think about yourself today and the Lord God in His holiness and His righteousness says, I want you to go to San Francisco. I want you to stand in that place and preach against sodomy. How many of you are like, Woo! I can't wait to get there. Well, I'll tell you, well, I'll give you some fair warning before you get there. The majority of the population is sodomites. There are laws against that in that place. They're fleshly carnal laws, and they go against the law of God. But I can guarantee you, at the very least, you would get arrested and thrown into the clink somewhere. You want to go? So when Jonah got this message, he was fearful. You know... If the preaching of hell is not fearful for you, be very careful. You know, after 30 plus years of salvation, hell is still fearful to me. When I, when I begin to think about the miseries of it, I give God great praise. I, I, don't even have to, I don't even have to consider hell. But it still makes me fearful. And if nothing else, it should make you fearful that people you love are headed that way. That, that, they are, that they are going in the direction that will certainly consume them. They're going in the direction that, that, that will cause them uh, to be in that place. And Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down in it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, a couple of things I'll just call your attention to. I don't know if Jonah was saved or not. A lot of people say certainly he was because he was sent to preach. Well, maybe, maybe that's true. But I will say this. He did not understand the complete character of God because you can't run from God. It is man's always, it is always man's impulse to try but you can't run from God. Adam in the first sin, he ran into the he ran into the woods and tried to hear, hide from God. He said, "Adam, where art thou?" And he says, "I have hid myself because I'm naked." See, the, that that is the res natural response to sin. It is to hide it. It is to move it out of the way. It is to try to shove it under the rug. And so I want you to see that was, to uh, that was Jonah's idea was to push this under the ground and let nobody see it. Verse 9. And he, meaning Jonah, said unto them, meaning his shipmates, and he said, and he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I... Fear the Lord. Now, I want you to see that, that he did fear the Lord, but his fear was fixing to be taken to a brand new level. Sinner friend, lost person, let me say this. You'd better fear God. You'd better feel, fear the mighty one that can cast you into hell. you better fear the mighty one that gives you even breath of life at the very moment that you're sitting before me. But you know what? The reason you're not consumed is because of the goodness of God. Amen. You better fear Him. And so he says, I'm a Hebrew and I fear God. Well, I'll say two things. He didn't fear him enough, but he was fixing to. He didn't fear him enough, but he, he was fixing to learn all about what the fear of God was about. Verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Now, I want you to see this. That they had more spirituality about them in some sense than Jonah did. Because when he laid it on the line, you know what? It put the fear of God in him. Now I'll say this. The fear of God is a lot better quality of fear than the fear of hell. The fear of hell, almost anybody with common sense... There is a fear of hell. Now it is a fleshly, carnal fear. 
It is a fear that we don't want to feel the fires of hell and the burning against our flesh that no doubt we will if we're not saved. But it is a carnal level of fear. The fear of God is a supreme fear, knowing that the character of God, if He says one thing to you, then we should be obedient. And if we're not obedient, then we should fear Him. And again, you know why? Because He could snuff you out at a moment, in a second. And everybody, you know what? Nobody wants to hear about that, uh, ca that character of God, do they? We, we've ran this mass of God is good so far that people don't even fear Him. You know what? He is good. But He is holy and He is righteous and He despises sin. That's the character of God no one, that's the character of God no one wants to hear. And so we see that these heathen people, and we'll see that even in that, God does a great work in their life. They feared God more than Jonah. They had an interest in the spirituality more so than even Jonah did. Drop down to verse 15. So they, meaning these men, took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Now, I want you to see also... That the elements around us are under the power of God. You know what? That should make you fearful. Do you know why? Do you know why the water got up way back in July? You know what? I've been living 48, almost 48 years. I have never heard of a flood in July. Have you? Not too recent. In fact, July and August was the driest months there were. I've seen people pray for their tobacco crop in July because it's withering on the hill. And we have the... Now, you know, every year, I don't understand, people in Tennessee have a special kind of stupid or what. But every year, oh, it was a 100-year flood. And we get another worse one, oh, that was a 200-year flood. You know why? Because they want to explain the power of God away. And so we have such a great flood... In the driest month historically at Tennessee, and the water is so great, a uh, creek that's a mile from my house got within a quarter mile of my house. That's the power of God. And see, we, we don't want to respect Him that way. You know what? I live on a tall hill, but you know what kept the water from my house? It wasn't where my house was at, it's where by the goodness of God. That, that's the only reason. That, and, and when we begin to think about that in those terms, certainly we will begin to fear God. So these ungodly, heathen men, throw him over the side because they fear God. I also want you to see that the elements ceased immediately. And you know why? Because the elements are under his power. Just like the flood in July, this was under his power. And he had the ability to do it. And so as soon as he huh, got Jonah, the, the sea stopped. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. And the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now I want to show you two things. First of all, this is the sovereign God of all the universe. Even in his rebellion, Jonah was a missionary. Because what happened to that ship crew? They learned about the great God Jehovah, did they not? In fact, they believed on the great God Jehovah. Said they offered sacrifices. And you know what? Have you ever thought about They had nothing left on the ship. Remember it said they threw everything overboard trying to... I don't know what they sacrificed, but whatever little bit they had left on the ship was precious little. And they still sacrificed it. See, that, that's, what, that, that's what our God can do. We can even be in rebellion, and He'll use that rebellion to His glory, because He will always be glorified in all things. In verse 17, I want you to also see that His little time down in the belly of the whale, or the belly of the great fish, whichever you want to call it. It's called both in the King James Bible. But I want you to see that it was three long days. You know what? I don't know when his repentance began. 
But a duty on this, as soon as he repented, the fish spit him out. So I have to believe, since it doesn't say, that he didn't repent to the end. Right? As soon as he made things right with God, said that he spit him out, and he went and did his missionary work. Right? So what about day one and day two? And the most of day three? Have you ever thought what was on the heart of Jonah? Have you ever thought about his rebellion? Do you, do you think he just got down there and said, Oh man, I made a big mistake. No, I think he stewed in his own juices for a while. And you know what? I don't think he was repented immediately. Do you? You know, repentance is a work that takes a while. True repentance is a work that takes a while. Because the magnificent God of the universe will let you stew in your own juices. And listen, we have some pretty putrefied juice sometimes to stew in. Malice, hate, non-forgiveness, self-righteousness. Oh, Brother Larry, I'm not none of those. Yes, you are, and I am too. We think we know everything, don't we? We don't know that. If we know that Bible cover to cover, the Bible says the half's never been told. So there's at least half of it you don't know, right? There's at least half we never even heard of. And so we see, we see then that Jonah had this period of time. I don't know what he did in it. I don't know, I don't know what his contemplations were. I don't know what he was considering. But I do know this, his repentance was not immediate. And you know what? Ours is not either. We get caught in a sin, and I don't mean people catching you. Being caught in the act, remember that is just the Judas level of repentance. Think about the woman that they brought before the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what they said about her? This woman was caught in adultery even in the very act. You remember that verse? Do you think she came repentant? doesn't say. You know, on that point, I'll say this. You never hear anything about the guy, do you? You know what? He was caught in the act too. Why not drag him in? He deserves it, right? The law is for everyone. But they drug, they drug the helpless woman in. And she said, she just threw herself on the mercy of Christ. He says, ye without sin cast the first stone. You know what? That means none of us is better than anybody else. And sin is not measured. Well, the disgusting part of me, the part of it is to me, you know what? They went in there and caught him. That's disgusting, isn't it? But nothing's ever said against sin. Sin is sin is sin. And when we begin to contemplate our self-sin, you'll drop your rocks real quick. Right? The Bible says sin is sin is sin. Ignoring the least of the commandments. We want to put adultery way up here. And murder way up here. But have you ever thought about the behavioral sins of the law? Did you ever think about they're the last six? And what are the four above them? Man to God. So if there is a priority, our relationship with Him... It's far more important from man to man, right? I, I believe that. And, and so we find, we find then that Jonah probably had some time before he actually repented. Verse 2, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. We don't know when this occurred. And said, I cried by reason of my infliction, affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now I'm not sure when this affliction fell on Jonah. Now sinner friend, if you've not experienced that affliction, you better make your calling and election sure. Because you know what? When you hit rock bottom of yourself 
and your self-righteousness and all these little tasks that we want to attach to salvation, being good and being kind and, and getting baptized and joining the church and all the foolishness that goes with that, you better leave this place knowing that you know Christ. That's all that matters. These other are attachments that may have made. And so we see then, as the Lord's people, that He, he went down into this place. He found repentance. He, he, he began to be sorry over sin. He began to be upset about what He had done. Verse 3, For thou hast, thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods come past me, about all thy billows, and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, cast out, ca then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. I want you to notice a couple of things about Jonah. First of all, you think about the peril as he was sinking down. Any of you ever seen the sea? Beautiful, glorious thing to, to look at. Last time I seen it was, I guess, when Sarah and Adam married and we went over to Savannah. And I looked out on the greatness of the sea and, and uh, was marveled what our God can do. But the thing about the sea is this. When the tide's rolling in, it's fine. When the tide's rolling back, it'll pull you with it. And if you've never pulled that, felt that undercurrent, you need to. Now, as Jonah was in this place, he knew he was helpless. Sinner friend, this morning you're helpless. There's nothing you can do. If you're depending on anything but the blood of Jesus, there's nothing you can do. See, he, he, he knew he was judging. And then I want you to see the amazing thing is this. Somewhere, somehow, down at the floor of the sea, inside this fish, it said, I turned and faced thy holy temple. You know what? Even in that place, somehow, he knew where redemption was at. He knew where Christ was. He knew to face the glory of God. And you know what? Under the miraculous power of Christ, I believe he looked straight to and that's what it takes for redemption. You look toward the person of Christ. Look at nothing else. Don't you, don't you, uh, I, I worry you, I, 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 I caution you. Don't look at yourself. And I'll go a step further. If you're trusting a sinner's prayer, you think very long and hard where that came from. And I'll say this, it came from you. And it's just as debauched as the rest of you are. You better have more than that when you leave this place. You know what salvation is when He speaks life. <clears throat> when He comes to you as the man that fell among thieves. And He binds up the wounds. He takes you up. He puts you on His own beast. And He leads you back. What, what, a, what a story of redemption. What, what, what a perfect a perfect example of what He does in our lives and the lives of those that are truly redeemed. Verse 5, The waters come past me about, even to the soul. So it's a spiritual thing. The death closed me round about, the weeds wrapped around my head, and I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, and the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought, my, brought up my life from corruption. Oh my God. Now I want you to notice another thing. Have you ever thought that he may have welcomed the fish? Because we don't know how quickly that prepared fish swallowed him up. Sounds like he sank, sank through the sea to myself. Because you think about it, if he was in the fish, how could he have known that? How could he know that he was sinking? I think he sank a while. I really did. And probably he was very grateful for the great fish. Because I bet he thought this, at least it's over. <laughs> I'm done. Right? That big fish came by and chomped him up. And he survived. <laughs> Don't you think he thought, now, now I'm down here. How long did it take for repentance to come? I don't know. I don't think it was immediate for you. 
And the fish took him even lower. And so we see then that Jonah learns a great deal about the character of God on the floor of the sea. Verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. That is when he received repentance. That's when he knew that God was God. When he remembered the goodness of God. When he remembered in verse chapter 2, verse 7. That is what he did. I want you to see the calamity that had to happen before he repented. Listen, dear friend, repentance is huge. Repentance is fellowship with Christ. Repentance for the believer and the non-believer. It's essential for a walk with Christ. It is essential. And we go by day by day and let our little sins, whatever that is, crowd up our life and push us away from Christ. And we don't even repent about it. Lost friend, I point you to Christ. You need genuine, real repentance. You need to run to Christ. You need to seek Him. You need to cry out. You need to look for Him. So we find in 7, Jonah at the floor of the sea inside the great fish. That's where repentance came from. Verse 8, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. You know what baptism is if you're clinging to salvation? It's a lying vanity. You know what joining the church is if you're trusting it for salvation? It's a lying vanity. You know what a vanity is? It's vain. It's something that you did and you're proud of. That's vanity. Right? If you're trusting the sinner's prayer, that's vanity. Because you did it, you said it, and therefore in your mind you accomplished it, right? Vanity. Vanity. What, what, did, what did Solomon find in Ecclesiastes 11? Vanity, vanity, all is vanity, right? It, it, everything under the earth was vanity. And so we find that he remembered, he prayed, verse 9, But I will sacrifice with thee the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. I believe his vow was that I will serve Christ. His vow was I will preach the gospel. His vow was I will be a preacher. All the days of my life, God being my helper, I vowed that I would preach the gospel and I will preach the gospel until the day I'm out of here. And that's and he remembered that vow. He recommitted to him himself to, to that. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon dry land. And so we see that that's how to escape hell. Escaping hell is repentance. Escaping hell is saying God's way is better than my way. Escaping hell is submitting yourself to a sovereign God. And say, have mercy on me. God, help me. Forgive me of my sin. It's pleading nothing less than the blood of Jesus Christ. What do you got this morning? Are you, are you, are you a fake? I've said it before and I'll say it again. I believe that way, month, the reason many of our churches are so weak is that they're full of lost people. Yeah. I want people to be saved. And after they're saved, I want them in the church. Right? Anybody ever seen any driftwood? We don't need driftwood. True driftwood. I grew up on the creek. I know what driftwood is. After it's floating around in the creek for sometimes years, you can pick it up and it's light as a feather. You can throw it in your stove and we burned it. And poof. And it's gone. But you know this, I remember this all my life. One time I was in a vacation Bible school. It wasn't when the Lord saved me. It was years prior to that. 
And the older class, I was a little bitty, but the older class took driftwood out of the creek there at Carlisle and painted it or varnished it. It was very shiny and very pretty. And they put flowers in it. It was a very pretty piece. But you know what it was? It was driftwood. Fancied up driftwood. That's it. And you know what? You may be nothing but fancied up driftwood. Send a friend and trust me. He's the only 